Thank you, Jesus. Did I get it, Keith? Did I do it right? Turn on the mic. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for your life and your, your breath within us. Every breath belongs to Jesus. It's a privilege to be with you this morning. So I had uh, I met a new friend in a developing country, and this friend told me right off the bat, he said, I'm an atheist. And of course, I was asking him, why are you an atheist? And he said, well, if there was a God, there wouldn't be starving children in the world. Uh, because anybody, he came from that country, and so he saw it firsthand. And he said that if anybody saw this and they could do something about it, uh, they would have compassion in their hearts and they would do that. So there must be no God because God would see this and he's not doing anything about it. But I told him that God gave us the responsibility of sharing with the poor and showing his love. And uh, so that friend, uh, he... He's not convinced yet, but in Jesus' name, um, he will find, come to know Jesus in a personal way. But God has given us the responsibility, not just responsibility, but also the privilege. It's actually a privilege. Um, this is not just a privilege or something that we can do from extra, but it's actually Jesus' mission. Do you remember the story, the account of when Jesus was beginning his ministry in the temple. Uh, I don't know if you have your Bibles with you or if you have your Bible on the phone or something, but I wanted to look at Luke chapter 4. Uh, it's nice if you see it right in front of you, so then you're thinking uh, it's actually in the Bible. It's not just something I'm making up to tell you a story today. Uh, and this was right in uh, chapter 4, verse 16 and 17. Uh, Jesus came to Nazareth, where he, was, where he grew up. So this was his hometown, and sometimes Jesus, uh, whoever it is in their hometown, doesn't get necessarily the respect that they get if they go somewhere else. <laughs> but Jesus was in his hometown. They've seen him grow up. And he came into the temple, and he began to read the scripture. And this was something that happened every single time that they met together. There would be somebody that would read the scripture, and it was Jesus' turn that Sunday. That, it wasn't Sunday, Saturday, Sabbath day. And Jesus came to the front to read the scripture. And he unrolled the scroll, and he read from the prophet Isaiah. He read this, this message. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to bring freedom to the captives, to heal the brokenhearted, to give sight to the blind, and to preach to the prisoners, you're free. It's the acceptable day of the Lord. Jesus' ministry in the temple. When he came to Nazareth, he, he knew this was his mission the whole time, but the people were just hearing this for the first time. And this was a message that the prophet Isaiah had said many years ago, but it was a prophecy for the Messiah. And it's actually a mission that Jesus has given to each one of us. This is your mission, should you choose to accept it. When Jesus said at the end of his ministry, he said, go into, the all, go into all the world and preach the gospel, the good news. And sometimes we think that's just spoken word. That's just telling people they need to accept Jesus, that he died for them, that he rose again. But the gospel is actually all those things that Jesus listed off at the beginning to bring good news to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to bring comfort to the lonely and strengthen uh, believers, because you see, my friend in this developing country had seen Christians come in with Bibles and hand out Bibles and preach the word of truth of the gospel. But he saw those same people just hand out Bibles and not hand out food or clothing. And so these people were struggling in their daily lives to to be able to have enough to eat, to be able to have enough clothing. And he saw this discrepancy, well, you're just giving them a Bible. They don't need a Bible. They need to have enough food today. They need to have enough food together to eat. And so it's not separate, this gospel, this good news, that when we share the good news of Jesus, it's the whole person, that Jesus wants to care for us 
as a total person. He cares for our physical, our mental, emotional, and spiritual. And sometimes in church we can just think, oh, it's all spiritual. And then we sing these songs like God is good and amazing grace and, and you're my breath. And then we go to daily life and we're like, oh, Lord, I got all these problems. I got bills. I've got these struggles at work and I've got all this stuff. And, and Sunday seems separate from the rest of the week, but it's not. It shouldn't be that we have the ability at every moment to just cry out to Jesus and say, Lord, I need your help with this problem. I need to know how I'm going to pay this bill. I need to know what to do in this situation with, in my workplace, in my school. I need to know your wisdom right now, Jesus. And that's his amazing grace every moment. I'm sure many of you do that, and maybe some of you that's like a new concept, but uh, I'm sure that many of you have been doing that for years. Just at every moment or every struggle or every trial, it's like, okay, God, you know, I need to know what you want me to do in this situation, and he's faithful. He's faithful to do that. Now, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit today about uh, the pastor's been doing a sermon series on I want, right? That right? So I was thinking, I was talking to him earlier a couple weeks ago, and I said, I want to, st- to store up treasures in heaven. I want to store up treasures in heaven. Jesus talked a lot about money. He talked a lot about finances. And sometimes in church, uh, everybody gets really quiet <laughs> when you start talking about money. I actually was uh, on staff, a pastoral staff at a church, about a thousand people, and the pastor would go on holidays, like your pastor's on holidays this Sunday, and um, he told me one time that he went away, he wanted me to preach on that Sunday, and he said, I want you to talk about tithing. (laughs) And you're laughing. I was, uh, I guess, naive enough to go, okay, sure, I can, it's in the Bible, talk about that. I didn't realize that some people uh, in the congregation had actually said, if the pastor's talking on tithing, I'm not coming that Sunday. Uh, or that people just get really uncomfortable when you start talking about money. But Jesus talked a lot about money, and so I'm not Jesus, but it's in the Bible, and I'm here to share with you um, what Jesus is saying in the Bible about treasures and about riches. And um, God thinks that money is an important subject, how we handle it, what we do with our finances, and how much we're willing to give of what he's given to us. Uh, Because you see, there's some lies that the enemy loves to tell us. He loves to say uh, things like, what's mine is mine. And we see that in kids from this high, right? Whose parents in here? have seen their kids, their, you, you give them all these toys, and you're like, share with your brother or sister, or share with somebody, and they're like, mine. It's like, it's almost the second word they learn, or the first word, I don't know, mine. The other one's no. <laughs> mine and no. <laughs> and and uh, like the little girl that um, was in McDonald's, um, who likes McDonald's french fries? Yeah, oh yeah, me too. And uh, so you get your fries and your package of fries, and uh, she, the little girl had the fries, and she's, and the dad said, can I have one of your fries? She's like, fine. No. no. <laughs> and because there never seems to be quite enough fries, you always want to have a little bit more. But uh, from the dad's perspective, he's like, wait a minute, I bought you those fries. <laughs> I, I'm giving you those fries. Yes, they're your, yours, but I actually bought you those fries. And we can kind of think of those in the same terms. It's like the money that we have, what we have is mine. But God said, what I gave you everything you have. Every good gift comes from the Lord. It's from the Father of lights. And you're, you might be saying to me, ah, I earned the money. I worked hard for this money. The money came in the bank account because I was at the job, and I, I did uh, a good job, and so they paid me for my job. But okay, who gave you the breath? Who gave you the strength? Who gave you the opportunity to do it? Who gave you the brain to be able to do your job? Who gave you that, uh, that blessing of having that opportunity. So it depends on how we look at it, but really the truth is, is that God has given us everything that we have. And God's the one that says that we should share. And God's the one that says that we should tithe. Sorry if I'm stepping on any toes. Well, actually, maybe I'm not really sorry, but, uh, but God's the one that says that what he has given to us, that we give a portion back to him, and that belongs to him. But he's also said that that, uh, t- to test me and to just see if that's true, that he will 
pour out blessing on our lives. That's in Malachi. You can look that up. It says, God says, bring the tithe into the storehouse. Bring the 10% is tithe into the storehouse and just test me and see if I won't pour out blessing upon you even more than you can possibly contain. So the enemy likes to, to lie to us and say, I don't have enough. I don't have enough. I don't have enough to give to God. I just have enough to pay my bills. I just have enough for what I need. I don't have enough. So that's another lie that the enemy likes to tell us. I don't have enough. But God says, yes, you do, because it's a gift from God. And by the way, the pastor didn't tell me to talk about tithing, so um, just straighten that out. You can even ask him. <laughs> um, but I did say I was, wanted to talk about storing up treasures in heaven. And God talks a lot about the poor in the Bible, even starting way back in the book of Deuteronomy. I don't know if you have, if you have your Bibles back there, but you can uh, have a look at that. In Deuteronomy chapter 10 and chapter 15, God was saying that he's bringing the people in to the promised land, and he was going to bless them and give them all kinds of things. And he's saying, what I'm blessing you with, I want you to share. Just like the little kid, okay, you've got all these toys uh, you need to share. And, uh, and God makes this very plain and, and a point. And so when we go and talk about Jesus, what he said in the, in the New Testament, when he talked a lot about treasures, Jesus said these words in, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. You want to turn there too if you have your Bible or your Bible on your phone? Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. Now the people were worried about not having enough. They were worried about not having enough. And Jesus said, don't worry about your clothes, what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear, because your father knows that you need these things. He knows that you have these needs in your life. He's a good father. What of the fathers here, you wouldn't, make, you wouldn't let your kids go without food. If it was in your power to do it, you wouldn't allow them to go without food or clothing or shelter. Those are, are things that a good father provides, and our Father in heaven provides those for us as well. So Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 19. Verse 19. It says, Don't hoard treasure here on earth. I think I might have got this verse wrong, the reference wrong. Don't hoard treasure here on earth. Don't stockpile it where, where moth and the rust can destroy, where thieves can break in and steal. But store up treasure in heaven where the moth and the rust can't come and the, the thief can't come in and steal. When Jesus talked to a rich young ruler in the Bible and he said, uh, the rich young ruler was coming to him and saying, Jesus, what do I need to do to get into the kingdom of God? I've done all these things. I've obeyed my parents. I've, um, I've done things that are, are good. Um, is there anything more that I need to get into, into the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus said, uh, basically, your money is standing in the way. Your money is standing in the way from you committing your heart completely to God, uh, completely to him. Uh, so in my own life, I, I feel like God's led me through um, a struggles or a path of kind of dealing with money because I probably wouldn't have been able to talk about this a few years ago even. Um, but just still, we're all learning, we're all uh, growing in this area. And I feel like God's brought me through this time of, of me feeling like I didn't have enough uh, doing ministry, doing a lot of traveling, uh, pouring out my heart to, to share with people about Jesus and talk about children in poverty as well, and, and um, feeling like there's a lot of need, um, but not, I wasn't necessarily getting as many finances coming back into my life as I needed, and so there was times that I was in the grocery store, and um, 
just kind of looking in the aisle. Now, I actually really like pickles. Anybody else here that really likes pickles? I'm kind of on my own. Oh, a couple of people. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, when we go to, when I go, get to go to Subway and they're putting all the stuff on the sandwiches, I always like, what, can you put more pickles, please? And they put a few more. I'm like, can you put more pickles, please? And like three more. Can you please put more pickles? <laughs> um, and so I really like pickles, but I'm... I'm standing in the grocery store about a year and a half ago or so, and I'm looking at the pickles, and I'm like, I don't have enough money to buy pickles and potatoes both. I have to just pick. <clears throat> pickles are good, but they're not really that nutritious, and you can get a bag of potatoes usually in PEI potatoes, which are awesome. You can get a bag of potatoes for around the same price as a jar of pickles, and so I thought, okay. Bag of potatoes is a better choice. Um, but to be in that kind of situation actually taught me a lot because uh, we don't often, we're not often in that spot that uh, we don't have, that we have to make that choice or we don't have enough to get some extra things. Um, but I'm not sorry, I'm not asking for any sympathy, but I'm saying thank you, Lord, for helping me to feel at least that, because I can taste a little bit of what it might be like to be like, I don't have enough money to even buy potatoes, because I had enough to buy some potatoes. Um, what would it be like to be in that kind of situation? The, there was a little boy, and he was um, in his bed trying to go to sleep, he was staring up at the dirty cracks on the ceiling wall, and he was thinking, uh, I'm just trying to block out the sound of voices in the other room. It wasn't really a room because there wasn't really a door, and it was just a curtain, but he could hear voices arguing in the other room. And so he, he knew what would be the result of that the next morning, is that the next morning his mom would say that she fell and she hurt herself, but he, he knew the truth because he had seen what happened, that his, his dad would, would be rough and mistreat his mom, and he saw what happened with his older brother, and he thought that he would be next. And this little boy, six years old, prayed a very desperate prayer. He prayed a prayer and said, God, I pray that you would rescue me but he prayed, I pray that you would kill my father. And we're like, mm, how could he pray that? But for somebody in that situation, in an abusive situation, those kind of thoughts and prayers of just escape, fight or flight, anything, God, to get me out of here, that's not an unusual thought. Three days later, there was a knock at the door and they had some bad news for the family. They had news that actually the father was killed. There was a fight down at the dock and uh, a scuffle, and the father was killed in that fight. And he, the little boy, Mario is his name, he saw his mom just burst into tears and just wailing and, and not sure at all, God, like saying, God, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And he couldn't understand because he thought, he thought she would be kind of relieved that she wouldn't be under that oppression and feeling that pain physically and emotionally. But uh, he didn't understand at six years old that his mom was thinking, how am I going to feed my family? What am I going to do now? The dad was bringing in money. Uh, what am I going to do to be able to, to provide for these kids, these three kids? Mario had a, a younger sister as well. And their home was thrown into this turmoil. But yet, a few days later again, there was another knock on the door. And a lady was at the door, and she had a big smile on her face. And she told Mario's mom and their family about uh, a program at the local church. 
And she said, we want to invite you kids to be part of this program at the local church. You'll get a meal every day. You'll get clothing if you need clothing. You'll get medical care to care for your needs medically. You'll um, be able to talk to somebody. And Mario didn't know the, the big official name, but it was a psychologist that he could talk to to talk about what had happened. Because you see, after praying this prayer, Mario, at six years old, thought it was his fault that his dad passed away, that his dad died. I mean, it wasn't his fault, but he kind of thought it was, and he needed to talk through that. And he had a lot of anger in his heart because of what he saw his dad doing um, to his family. And this lady invited the kids to be part of this program at the local church. And they were so excited because they knew some friends down the street that were part of this program as well. And they learned games. And they learned uh, schooling. They learned hygiene and how to take care of their own bodies and how to prevent disease by making sure they washed. And uh, they had prepar preparation of food that's, that was hygienic. And Mario grew. And he said that it was... It wasn't until he was 13 years old that he actually was able to forgive his father and forgive his father for the, for the abusive situation that they were in and to understand that it wasn't his fault. But I had the opportunity to meet Mario in Nicaragua, is his country, in January 2018, so just about a year and a half ago. And he told this story, and he started out by saying, when I was six years old, I, w I prayed that my father would be killed. And Mario had an amazing just love for Jesus. He had a face shining. To, he, was, he had gone through the program at the local church, which the big name is Compassion, but... Uh, the kids that go there didn't really know that big name, Compassion. They knew the pastor at the local church, the workers at the local church that were believers, that spoke their own language, that knew them even sometimes when they were growing up. And Mario was an accountant then at the Compassion program at the local church. And he said he wanted to start a Bible study to help all the kids um, in addition to the programs that they were going through at Compassion. And so he was taking extra Bible training as well to be able to share with the kids uh, there. And this is an opportunity to store up treasures in heaven. I, I sometimes think of myself, uh, somebody asked me what I do, and one time I answered, I'm an investment specialist. <laughs> Uh, because we have our opportunities to invest in a lot of things in this earth, but like Jesus said, we store up our treasures in, on earth, and moth, and rust, and banks, and uh, stocks go down, and stuff happens um, to our treasure. But the Lord says in Proverbs, whoever gives to the poor lends to the Lord, and the Lord will repay. And so the Lord is the one that gives interest on the money that we give to him. And another lie that the enemy loves to tell us here is that uh, kind of we were talking about what my, what's mine is mine and I don't have enough. And another lie is that if I give, yeah, if I give, I won't have enough. Uh, but the lie is that, uh, and the lie has gone out of my brain. So <laughs> we, if we examine the things that we actually believe, oh yeah, okay, that uh, somebody that's telling you a story like this or here representing compassion is kind of just telling you the story because I want your money, but I don't want your money. <laughs> it's not for me. It's not for me. Uh, but God has given me this mission on behalf of these children. I told Mar Mario that I would tell his story uh, to as many people as I could that have way more stories than just Mario. Um, of stories of God's transforming power and life in the hearts and the lives of people. Um, this mission that Jesus has given to us, this privilege that he's given to us, is not just for us to give a little bit extra out of our extra. Um, Jesus also saw the people coming in. He was actually watching when they came to put the money in the offering. And Jesus was watching, and he saw the rich people put their money in an offering. And he saw a widow come in and put in a couple dollars. 
It says a widow's mite, a couple of coins. And Jesus didn't say, wait, wait, what are you doing? Don't put that in. You don't have enough money to live on. You better keep that for yourself. Let all the rich people put the money in the offering. But he said, no, that woman put in more than everybody else because she put in what she had to live on. Uh, That's a pretty intense story because we would be like, don't put the money in the offering. But God has so much promise to take care of us. He's promised that he will be the one that takes care of our needs. I've seen that in my life when I'm like, okay, Lord, I need to know how to pay this bill. And I'm coming to him at that moment saying, okay, God, please, I need a miracle. And I've seen him come through time and time again, time and time again. He's faithful. God is faithful. Jesus told another story of uh, the sheep and the goats when they appeared before him at the end of time. And all the people appeared before him and they said, um, Lord, we've done these things in your name. We've, we've uh, given, to your, given to your kingdom. And Jesus said, but wait a minute. Depart from me. I never knew you because when I was hungry, you didn't give me food. When I was thirsty, you didn't give me drink. When I was naked, you didn't clothe me. When I was sick and in prison, you didn't visit me. Um, and they said, Lord, when do we see you? In that situation, because if we would have saw Jesus in that situation, if Jesus walked in the store right now and he was, you know, not having enough clothes and he was hungry, you'd be like, Jesus, can we get you a burger from McDonald's? Can we, you know, what can we do? We want to get you some fries. I'll share my fries with Jesus. Absolutely. Um, well, Jesus, when do we see you? And he said, whenever you saw the least of these, That was actually me. Whenever you did it, or you didn't do, or you did, to the least of these, you did it to me. Um, There's a, the good part of that story is when Jesus said to the people, come into the reward of the kingdom. And it wasn't because uh, they went to church. He didn't list that. Sorry, he didn't list, you read the Bible, you had your devotions every day. Um, all those, those things are really important. He listed the things, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was naked, you gave me clothing. When I was sick, you visited me. When I was in prison, you, you comforted me. Uh, this is an investment opportunity with compassion, but we also have the opportunity to invest in the lives of people around us, our neighbors, our friends right here. Um, some people think, uh, they say, oh, uh, why should we give money to a different country? We need to have poor people here in our country. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's not either or because Jesus said, um, you shall be witnesses to me both in Jerusalem. That's kind of their area that they were in. Judea is the area next to them. Samaria, that was where people didn't want to go. So I think that's kind of like Tignish, maybe. Uh, They didn't want to go there. And then uh, to the uttermost parts of the earth. So it's not an either or. Have a short video from Compassion that just shares the story of kids from their perspective. There's so many stories like this of kids growing up through the program but becoming world changers themselves. And so let's meet a few of those people and watch this video. In the Philippines, it's so smelly, very dark water. You can see trash, rats. In a given week, we'll go at least for three days without food. The friends that I played with in the neighborhood got captured and was being trained to become child soldiers. We would beg our parents just to buy one apple, but even the rotten ones we could not afford to buy. In a period of 18 months, I lost my small brother Patrick, my mom, and I lost my stepdad because of the terrifying disease of HIV AIDS. When my mother died, I was lost. I was looking for hope. 
for God to just show me that everything was going to be okay. I would be so jealous with other kids. I would feel that I don't really count. Since God you say you love us, why do you have to take so much from me? I don't know why Aaron Mitchell decided to sponsor me, but when he did, my whole life changed. People from Compassion showed up at my church. But they said, you're going to go to school, and then somebody's going to write to you. I don't have to worry about whether my parents would have enough money to keep me going to school long enough to become that educated person uh, that I wanted to be. We go to school, and it's usually like really good meal that we don't usually eat, and especially spaghetti and fried chicken. <laughs> and you like, you can never get sick. Someone was there to take care of me. I felt safe. I felt wanted. My sponsor is Edwin Bunny. Maria and Hanshru. Aaron Mitchell. Five women from a Lutheran church that were sponsoring me, that really invested in my life and changed my life. I am now a physical therapist and I'm working in a hospital. And today I'm a clinical social worker. I was the first child in my family to go to high school. I was the first child in my family to go to college. I have a bachelor and a master in, in uh, biomedical engineering, a second master in engineering management, and uh, that called me into ministry. So I had to go and get a third master, a uh, master of divinity. In Kenya today, I have a ministry called Youth Arise Africa that works with boys who don't have father figures. We opened a small school. It's now providing the same opportunity that Compassion provided to me to close to 300 kids so that they too can break out of the cycle of poverty. Whatever you do for the least of these, you do for me. You did it for me. You did for me. Sponsor a child today to break the cycle of poverty in a child's life like my sponsor did for me. investment specialist is saying this is a good place to invest your money for the kingdom of God. I've been to programs with compassion in many different countries. There's an open book policy. Anything you want to know about finances, about the work they're doing, the money goes to the kids and it makes a difference. These kids are, are growing up to become world changers. And it's not that compassion is the one doing all this amazing work. It's a vehicle for you and I to be part of change in the world. It might not be possible to, for you to get on a plane and actually physically give food and clothing to a child, but that's exactly what you're doing when you pick up that packet and you fill it out and you write a letter to your child and you say that you love them and you're sending the means for them to break that cycle of poverty. So uh, the band is going to come up. We're going to do one final song. But in the back, there's packets. These are actual kids. These are the only packets that we have for those particular kids. And so you can't just take the packet home until you fill out the information or we know where that packet is for that child. For sponsoring a child, is $41 a month. And some people will be like, oh, no, $41 a month. That sounds like a lot. Uh, but maybe you go out for dinner with your family or you go to McDonald's or something like that or you buy a lobster dinner and uh, $41 a month is um, not a lot compared to that. Uh, but the Lord will give you wisdom. The one guy, he said five women from a Lutheran church sponsored him. And so that, let the Lord guide us what he would have us to do. This is one investment opportunity. May the Lord give us hands and feet to walk out this good news, this amazing truth, not just spiritually, but practically for our neighbors, for the people around us, for people that we can change in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>